Hello and welcome to the North Seattle College Art Gallery's Virtual Visiting Artist Lecture Series. I'm Amanda Knowles, the coordinator of the NSC Art Gallery, and I teach printmaking and drawing in the art department at North Seattle College. I'm pleased to work with Desiree Beadle, who's assisting in the gallery and will be doing things behind the scenes here today, as well as minding the gallery. I want to remind you that the NSC Art Gallery is nothing without uh, support from the college and from all of you. Uh, thank you for the help that you have given to the gallery by coming to these events and sharing them with people that you know who might enjoy them. Today, we are thrilled to have the artist and fashion designer Janelle Abbott talking with us here in the Zoom space. I want to tell you early on that we have live transcript available for those of you who want it. It can be turned on by clicking the button that says show subtitle at the bottom of your Zoom screen. For those of you who don't want it or find it distracting, you can turn it off by clicking hide subtitle. Use it if you wish, hide it if you wish, but we want to make sure that we have it for those that need it. So we're going to start with some acknowledgments. First, the land acknowledgement. North Seattle College acknowledges that we occupy the lands of the Coast Salish peoples, the descendants of the first peoples of this region, a people whose cultures endure and are valued. Without this land and these cultures, we would not have access to this gathering, dialogue, and learning space. We take this moment to honor and thank the original caretakers of this land, their ancestors, and their descendants who are still here. We encourage participants here today to consider our responsibilities as we stand in solidarity with the sovereignty, cultural heritage, and lives of Native, Indigenous, and First Nations peoples. And then we have a labor acknowledgement. We also pause to recognize and acknowledge the labor that created the United States and from which we all benefit. We remember that our nation is built on the labor of enslaved people who were forcibly brought to the US from the African continent, and we recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We acknowledge immigrant labor and recognize that voluntary forced and prison labor contribute to the building and ongoing maintenance of our nation. We acknowledge all unpaid caregiving labor. Additionally, we acknowledge the critical importance of the work towards racial equity that continues across this country in response to racial injustice and generations of structural racism against BIPOC communities. And then this third slide, uh, is what we are doing as we continue to work to go from acknowledgement to deed. We know that it is not enough to just acknowledge the land and labor and have to be sure that we are taking action. We show you here what actions North Seattle College and the NSC Art Department are taking to support BIPOC individuals and institutions and to be held accountable. We recommend Real Rent Duwamish and we will put that link in the chat for you to explore. Thank you. And I will just keep going. Um, this is the last week of Janelle Abbott's exhibition, Helen Ramona, part two, uh, that is hanging in the NSC Art Gallery. The show closes this Friday at 2 p.m. We hope you will have a chance to stop by. Campus parking enforcement is back, so when you come to campus, please visit the parking kiosks on campus and call the Art Gallery for the code that gives you access to two-hour parking. There is information on the Plan Your Visit tab on the NSC Art Gallery website. Um, we are very excited that we will be uh, holding a closing event with the artist this Thursday, April 27th from six to nine. For this event, please park in the college's north parking lot. For students, Friday is the application deadline for the student show. Drop off of artwork for this show is Friday from two to five and next Monday, 11 to four. The application is available on the NSC Art Gallery website under ex the exhibitions tab. For the rest of you, the 2022-2023 NSC juried student art exhibition opens to the public on Monday, May 15th with an opening celebration on Wednesday, May 17th from three to 6 p.m. So please keep checking in on with the art gallery on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website to find out what's going on in the gallery and who we will be talking to and when. The next virtual visiting artist lecture will be on Monday, June 5th with artist Megan Elizabeth Trainer, who is in the audience here. We urge you to visit our website for links to recordings of all of the talks to date, as well as the list of upcoming visiting artists. We will post our links in the chat 
to everything that we do, you can sign up for emails by contact, contacting us at nscartgallery at seattlecolleges.edu. Um, thank you. With that, I introduce you to my colleague, Paula Rebson, who invited Janelle Abbott to show in the NSC Art Gallery. Paula teaches sculpture, ceramics, two-dimensional design, art business, and more. <laughs> and she is the faculty mentor to the NSC Art Group and, and really so much more. Uh, Paula is an incredible artist whose thoughtful work holds an incredible amount of emotional tension. Thank you for all that you do, Paula, and for introducing us to Janelle. And I give it to you. Well, thanks, Amanda. I didn't know you were going to add a little blurb about me, so I appreciate that. <laughs> Welcome so much, everybody. I'm really excited to have you here, and I hope that we continue to see more people join, but um, this will be recorded and will live on in that way. I'm so excited to get to introduce you to Janelle Abbott, who will be speaking today. As Amanda said, my name is Paula Repsom. I am full-time faculty in the art department at North Seattle College. And just a little background on how this exhibition came to be and how I connected with Janelle Abbott. Last year, I participated in a climate justice faculty institute at the college. This was facilitated by Heather Price from North Seattle and from Sonia Remington Doucette from Bellevue College. The goal of the institute is to build bridges between disciplines in order to help faculty incorporate climate change, uh, climate justice, and civic engagement topics into our core curriculum in ways that empower students and, and encourage student retention and success. So as part of an extension of this work, I was given an opportunity to curate an exhibition at the NSC Art Gallery, and I immediately thought of Janelle Abbott. So I was first introduced to Janelle's work about five or six years ago, and I've been following her practice ever since. Uh, some might even say stalking, no, <laughs> just kidding, <laughs> uh, ever since. Uh, and I've just really been hoping that there would be an opportunity for me to um, be able to work with her. So this was a real uh, pleasure. What initially drew me to her work was the color and playful nature of it and the cross-disciplinary approach of all of her work. What has kept me a forever fan is her commitment to upcycling, sustainability, handcraft, and the zero waste design methodology that you can see within all of her work. She is certainly forging her own path, and it's one that aims to call attention not only towards the waste streams produced from fast fashion, which are pushed by corporate fashion brands, and then the environmental damage perpetuated by them, but that also highlights the exploitive labor that goes into the manufacturing of every consumer product we engage with. And this is not an add-on to her work. It is her work, and she labors over it tirelessly. So recently I read a posting from Janelle on Instagram where she said, this quest I'm on can feel very futile, if not foolish in the face of these realities. Every day I show up to do this work, fight the system, enact and encourage change in my own way, but it's getting harder. So I want you to know Janelle that your work is appreciated and I'm sure that today you're gonna create many more forever fans <laughs> like I am that will uh, continue to help take up this fight with you. Um, before I hand the floor over to Janelle, because I'm so excited to hear what you all what you have to say, um, I want to highlight a few things from Janelle's resume. She received a BFA in fashion design from the Parsons School of Design in 2012 and has had numerous exhibitions, installations, and performances, both locally and also uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, she's had her work featured in publications and video segments, including Crosscut, Art Zone with Nancy Guppy, Document Journal, and was also featured in Teen Vogue as a 2019 emerging designer. Uh, her garments can be found at numerous locations, and Desiree is going to link to these in the, in the chat, so you can uh, go and see more of her work and also help support her, um, uh, her process. Uh, I'm proud to own one of Janelle's pieces. This is a shirt that I ordered at the height of the pandemic when I was looking for the perfect demo shirt to wear. So some of my students might recognize this, but what was really humorous is when I got this shirt in the mail, she said, I made this for a craft tutorial for the at Melissa official site in April of 2020. So I gotta go and watch the demo of my shirt being made that then I then wore for almost all of my demos <laughs> during the during the pandemic. So thank you again so much for being here. And uh, once again, I'm excited you're all in for a treat. Um, is it my turn? <laughs> okay, um, I'm just gonna share my screen. 
Cool. So hi, everyone. Um, yeah, as was stated, my name is Janelle Abbott. My brand is JRAT Zero Waste. And the name JRAT has a funny story behind it. I used to write a fictitious newspaper when I was in elementary school, and my friend and I would fax them back and forth. And it was called the J.R. Abbott Times, which I resurrected in 2010 while I was in college. And then I continued writing it for about 10 years. But in like 2016 and onwards, fake news became um, not as fun as it used to be. So I stopped writing my fictitious newspaper, but the the newspaper was called the J-Rat. And so that's what I named my brand after. But um, just to begin a little bit about my upbringing, I was homeschooled through ninth grade because my parents owned a clothing manufacturing company and my mom, um, I think, wanted to find a way to integrate creative education more holistically into my day to day. So I spent a lot of time at the warehouse because they manufactured everything in Seattle, Washington at the time. So I learned how to sew at a really young age and had access to a lot of materials to explore and play. And that's what really solidified my personal love for and pursuit of a career in fashion design, even though my parents were hesitant to support me because they understood how difficult the industry is. And actually in about 2003, their company closed because the market had really shifted by that point, um, large in part because September 11th happened during New York Fashion Week. So all the showrooms shut down and the buyers went home and that meant there was a major rift in sales for them that season. And then right at that same time, fast fashion became more readily av available in the United States. And since a lot of people were suffering from the recession and all the other economic um, difficulties that came after September 11th, the way that people shop for clothing started to really change. And we can see it's still very different today than it was even pre-2001. Um, so yeah, their company closed in 2003 and that meant both my parents lost their jobs at the same time, which was a pretty traumatic experience. But being young and naive and like not knowledgeable of how trauma was affecting my life, I took it in stride. And that's when I started thrifting and exploring how to deconstruct pre-existing clothing and create them into new things. Um, Cause you could still find pretty decent vintage at the thrift stores at that time. And a lot of like really ugly late seventies and eighties garments. So I would reconfigure those in new and different ways. So after high school, I went to Parsons School of Design. And even though I was pursuing a career and an education in fashion, I still had all these other different interests that I wanted to maintain as well, which today my work includes furniture, art, a project where I work with private clients called wardrobe therapy. Of course, fashion is my main avenue of creative expression and dance also. I grew up taking dance classes. And so while I was in college, I was trying to find a way to merge all of these different creative forces into one. Um, but I was in a very traditional fashion program at what was called the Uptown Fashion uh, Program at Parsons School of Design in New York City. And I had a lot of professors who questioned why, why I was there. They, I remember one professor distinctly asking me, why aren't you in fine arts? Like, why are you here? And I told him, I wanna learn how to create clothing well. I wanna learn the techniques, I wanna learn the craft of garment production because I had seen garment workers in person working at my parents' company um, growing up. So I knew what the labor behind fashion required. I think my motivation for pursuing an education in fashion design was very different than what the teachers experienced with um, the other students, like we were going to that school to become, you know, trained to be the next Marc Jacobs. And I, I wasn't really looking at that as what I wanted to achieve. I wanted to achieve a practice and a process and a way to approach fashion from a fine artist lens. So you can go to the next slide, um, which represents my senior thesis from 2012. So all the materials that I use for my thesis, I sourced either directly from the garbage because I would just scour the streets of Manhattan at night and find like bolts of dead stock fabric that stores had thrown away or end cuts from bolts from other students or I got it 
from the Goodwill outlet, or in the case of the shoes, I found those shoes like in a free box on the street. So I try to repurpose materials in part because it's, I think, a creative imperative to re configure what already exists because so much material exists, but it also was a financial necessity for me and that I didn't have the funding in order to create the collection that I wanted. So I really tried to allow the process of creation to dictate the aesthetic and take these materials through a process to transform them into new and better forms. And that has become a cornerstone of my practice even today. Another cornerstone that I gained from my education at Parsons is the zero waste pattern drafting methodology, which I learned from Timo Rasanen, who was one of my professors. This is a really basic comparison between traditional patterns, which would be the illustration on the left, and a zero waste pattern, which is the illustration on the right. So on the left, all the red areas are waste because these pattern pieces aren't designed in relationship to one another. They're designed in relationship to the final garment and perhaps uh, the fit model or the body type that this garment is trying to address. So it's about 15% of all materials that are wasted during the production of traditional garments. And what is blue on the left illustration, those pieces get cut out and assembled into just like a basic t-shirt form. Whereas on the right, you can see this zero waste pattern, all the pattern pieces are designed in relationship to one another so that nothing is wasted. And there's like a symbiotic relationship between the two pieces. So making an adjustment to one side of a line makes an adjustment to another side of a line. So the zero waste method, it's like designing a giant puzzle. And when that puzzle is deconstructed, it becomes a garment. And in reverse, if you took that garment apart, you could turn it into a perfect square or rectangle of fabric once again. But it's difficult. There's a lot of math involved, which was not my strong suit in high school and I took zero math in college. Um, but for me, what I found about zero waste pattern drafting was it was really creatively liberating because I could relinquish a certain sense of the ego to the process because the process was always going to dictate the outcome. Every pattern had to equal a perfect square or rectangle. So it meant sometimes I was designing a pattern and I got about 50% of what I was looking for, but then I had extra material, which pushed the aesthetic beyond what I could like intellectually conceive of. So since learning this process, I very rarely sketch the outcome of the garments that I want to create. I really just sketch these zero waste patterns and then through the process of construction sort of just discover what the aesthetic is and in so doing I've learned a lot of different numbers and formula in order to manifest the aesthetic that I'm looking for today but obviously between my thesis collection and what I'm doing today like things have changed aesthetically uh, it's just a reiteration that this zero waste along with repurposing existing materials and this relinquishing control to the process are all really fundamental components of my creative work. So I went to Helsinki to perform in 15%, which was an installation mounted by my professor, Timo, who taught me zero waste. So my role was to cut, sew, and package white t-shirts, and they were sold in the gallery's gift shop for five euros. So it was both illustrating the wasteful practices of garment production, but also the true labor behind clothing construction. And when people would see me physically making these garments and then look in the gift shop and be like, why are why is this only five euros? That's not enough. I just watched you for an hour make this garment. And I'm like, that's exactly the point. There are no machines. There is no full automation to produce clothing today. Like there's no robot who's going to cut, sew, and finish a garment end to end. You always have to have human labor in the process. And the process is so much broader than that because it begins with the picking of the cotton that then gets processed into the fabric that then gets cut and sewn into the garment. And then it gets shipped worldwide to all these retailers where you have another layer of labor, which are people selling the garments in the retail environment. So I was really honored to be a part of that installation because it very much aligned with my personal convictions as an artist. And I think it really 
merged worlds in a way that I was looking to do both fashion production and performance art, which going forward is something I'm still interested in exploring. So there's a big chunk of my career in this presentation that I've just like left out because between graduating and then about 2020, I worked three different jobs because I had student loans to pay off and I didn't want to put pressure on my creative work to be my main source of income. So I was a tour guide for the Seattle Underground. I was a studio assistant for an artist. I learned how to weave chairs like cane, wicker, Danish modern. So I did antique furniture restoration for that same artist. I became a yoga teacher. I started a donation-based yoga class that was weekly. Um, but when the pandemic came, all those jobs disappeared. And it was ironic in a sense because I had created all of these different sources of income in order to prevent the total loss that I had experienced in my youth when both my parents lost their jobs at the same time. I'm like, one job's gone. I still have two others. But then the pandemic came and I lost all those jobs and all I had left was my creative work. So that's when I really had to shift focus and be like, okay, I need to find a way to make my art my livelihood. And it's been quite a journey. This particular slide just represents the year of 2020, which was certainly a transition year for everyone. And so in that year, I did three different collections. Um, 2021, I did like 14 collections. So this is only a handful of them, but I started to promote my work more on Instagram and get more job opportunities through that, like working with two different dance companies to create costumes for their performances and exploring more of a ready to wear approach of clothing, which were zero waste garments that I was able to replicate from one bolt of fabric. Whereas if you look at most of these images, it's a lot of reconstructed pre-existing clothing mixed with um, reclaimed textiles. Because in 2020, I was able to dig in the basement at the old Seattle Curtain Factory and salvage like three dozen bolts of fabric or more. So since then, I've been using a lot of that material. And for me, that's very important. The process that I gather material is as much a part of the art as the art itself. So all of these images, I could tell you exactly where I got the fabric or if someone donated it to me. At this point, I started to have a lot of people DM me saying, I'm moving. Do you want some of my clothes? And I would look through the images they sent me and be like, this is garbage. I don't want any of this. But then respond and say, yeah, I'll take it. Because again, that that like struggle, the necessity to invest time and energy into making something that is unused or even like despicable, you know, like a polyester jacket from H&M, like that shouldn't exist. Nobody wants that. But I feel like it's part of my practice and my mission to find a way to validate the existence of that garment through dyeing, painting, embellishing other textile manipulation methods. And then of course, this process of zero waste upcycling. So in 2021, I made 550 garments by hand. In 2022, I made 500 garments. This year, I think I've made over 110. Um, and these images represent, a, again, a variety of projects, including I was able to costume a play for the first time in West Seattle. And I was able to present some of my work during New York Fashion Week um, with a store that I sell at in London, who is doing an event there, because I still have connections to New York since I went to school there and a lot of my friends still live there. The image on the top right represents a particular collection I did where I bought a 50 pound box of t-shirt scraps, which you can buy for industrial use, like wiping down automobiles and things like that. And it was cheaper to buy a box that had prints on them. So I went through and I took out all the prints and separated it from the white pieces. And I cut the white pieces into strip and made it into yarn. And that's what I used to do like the weaving and knitting for my more fine art, like wearable furniture work. And then all the prints I cut into strips after I took all the letters out. So I have hundreds and hundreds of t-shirt letters that I'm gonna use in a future project. Um, but this image in the top right, it's just strips of different prints from this box of t-shirt waste that I, sewed side by side onto garments that either 
um, were stained or damaged or didn't really have much use aside from being the backing for these pieces. And that's a technique that I use within all my collections. I save all my scraps for the end of the project. And then I'll sometimes sew them into yarn and knit them or weave them into pieces, or I'll sew them side by side onto um, usually lining. I actually have here, this is a bag of just lining that I've saved from all different projects because it's really cheap fabric and it doesn't have a lot of like front facing use, but it's good to use to back for pieces like that. So that's one way that aside from doing zero waste pattern drafting, I have created these zero waste upcycling methods so that when I start a project with a collection of materials, I end the project with that same collection of materials. There's nothing that gets thrown away. There's nothing that gets put in a bag and saved for later, except for things like this lining. So this is a shot from my installation last year at Slip Gallery in Belltown, and it represents the first time I was able to present the majority of my creative expressions in one space. So it features the wearable furniture and there is a wearable chair and pant pillow on display at the North Seattle College Gallery right now. Um, there also were wearable rugs are on display, which kind of like center left, those are the two pieces on the floor. And then on the wall in the background, there's this painted sky background. So painting has always been a part of my process and practice. I do a lot of painting on fabric and clothing themselves, but this is one example of a painting that just stands alone. And then the two sort of figures on the wall are an exploration that I began to represent fashion design in a new way. So they're almost life-size humanoid figures and they're created from reclaimed clothing and textiles. I wanted to be able to present my fashion work in a more 2D form. But just the same, the clothing that I create, it's very sculptural, it's meant to be lived in. And I feel like as much as you could wear it on the body as a work of art, you could hang it on the wall as a work of art. And that's like a concept shift that I wanna manifest in my own life and encourage other people to view as well, that your closet could really become a gallery space in and of itself. Just as much as you'd hang art on the wall, you can hang art in your closet and treat it like, like a gallery. It's another image from that same installation. On the right, there's a close-up of what I call wall dolls. And this is a series I wanna to continue to explore. So the wall dolls, yeah, they feature a lot of materials that I wouldn't want to use in clothing because it's like a nasty polyester or it's my old tights or a bunch of old underwear and bras someone donated to me at one point or things I've just found on the road, items that are like too heavy to cut and sew into clothing. And in the case of this one, it features a bunch of beads and jewels that my grandmother gave to me because she and my aunt would go to the thrift store and buy these big jars of beads for like 10 bucks and then sort through them for fun and then that was their fun and they dump them off on me. So it's like, I have all these beads I need to find a use for. And then on the left is just another image of a painted backdrop and three different wearable chairs. So this is 2023. I just wanted to give some examples of process images where um, I'm dyeing fabric, I'm painting fabric. The three images on the left, the bottom one in the middle with the white, garment pieces. So that's an image of the process I went through to create one of the pieces that's hanging in the North Seattle gallery right now. It's a layer of white fabric with lace that I resourced from a custom bridal shop. It was just like offcuts from them. And then that waist is sandwiched between like a sheer sort of mesh and I hand stitched through it to set everything before actually constructing the garment. And then bottom left on the left edge, that's the wearable chair that's also at the gallery right now as it was in process. So I wove the whole chair first before binding all the arms and legs. And then the sweater is knit separately and attached. And top right on the corner, that image of stacked materials, that's just an example of how I curate the materials that I work with. I'm really specific about 
gathering materials for each collection that I feel have a resonance amongst them. And then once I have all those materials gathered, I sort them out into different little stories. And so from that stack of material, I'll create a segment of garments for that particular collection, which will be the third iteration of Helen Ramona. And then on the right, those illustrations represent some of the sketching that I do in the process of doing zero waste pattern drafting, because it can help me figure out how to pattern those pieces once I draw these kinds of flats. And the, the bottom little sketch, that's the baby dress that's at the gallery right now. Yeah, and I just wanted to provide some images of the exhibition that's currently at the gallery. It's inspired by my grandmother who passed away in December of last year. And the installation is sort of about how we mythologize people and sort of come up with an alternative narrative for them based on their our understanding of their own experience. So I wanted to create garments that represented different points in her life from being a child to a young woman, to a mother, uh, to a world traveler in her old age. And then there's a garment that kind of represents her spirit, which is very playful and clownish. She was pretty goofy. So yeah, some other points I just wanted to touch on, like my motivation behind my work, as I said, it's really about social justice because there's 40 million people enslaved in the world today. And that's in all different factors, including production. About 20 million people are estimated to be in situations of exploited or forced labor. And a lot of those people are making the material goods that we experience every day. And then you contrast that with the myriad of thrift stores across the city and the country that's full of stuff that no one wants. And that's a scary, rabbit trail I go down trying to imagine how many clothing stores exist in this city simultaneously, how much stuff is in there and how it just has nowhere to go. So I personally have divested from investing in newly manufactured clothing since I was 15. That's when I learned about human trafficking and issues of modern day slavery. I said, I don't want to buy newly manufactured clothing because I don't want to become complicit in the exploitation of someone else. And I also see a lot of value in the things that already exist, um, but it's really hard to live that way and not everyone can do so because a lot of clothing that's manufactured today, uh, it it's hard or even from the past, it's really hard to address every body size that's out there. So people who are plus size and larger or struggle with their physical ability, it can be harder for them to find clothing that actually is appropriate for their lived experience. So I understand like the, the issue is really complicated and no one should feel shamed for how they shop or what they're able to manage as far as what they're supporting with their money. But um, I, I'm trying to solve a problem in my own way, which is waste reduction, which is divesting from exploitive systems, which is bringing attention to the reality of exploitive labor in the production of clothing. And today is actually the 10 year anniversary of the Rana Plaza collapse in Dhaka, Bangladesh, where over a thousand garment workers were killed. And those people were being employed, subcontracted by brands like Gap and brands we all know. Um, so these issues, they're incredibly modern. They're historical as well. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire happened in 1911 and over a hundred garment workers died in that. And as you mentioned in the introduction earlier, like the entire United States is built on exploitative labor because we wouldn't have become the nation that we are today without cotton exportation and cotton was picked by transatlantic slaves. So the whole industry is built on this really disgusting platform of exploitation. And I'm always asking to what end, you know, are we just going to keep producing materials that people don't want? Like, that's not how I want to live. And so in my own way, which, yeah, as I said, it can be really hard to fight this fight because since labor is devalued in the production of clothing, it can be really hard for people to be able or willing to invest the kind of money necessary to compensate labor in production, like my work. And right now we're like, inflation is out of control. We're heading towards a recession. It's, it's just getting really difficult to continue to fight for this particular cause and do it in a way that's like uplifting and not doom and gloom because <laughs> at least in my own experience it can be really easy to fall into that doom and gloom.
But I think that's why I, I create work that's playful, that is childlike, that has a lot of enigmatic creative energy within it. And that's what I want to lend to the world. So I will keep doing what I'm doing, but just always trying to figure out how to do it better, how to do it with more sustainability across the board. I think that's all I have. There's a lot of notes I didn't reference, but I think that's almost my time. Okay. Did we go through all the slides? Oh, there's a couple more. So this, this one just had some facts about the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire and then the factory collapse in DACA. And then the next two are um, some examples of my wardrobe therapy service where I work with private clients to reconstruct clothing that they already own, but maybe they don't wear for some reason, but they can't get rid of it. And I know everyone here probably has a bag of clothes that they're just waiting to resolve. So if you go to the next slide, um, I go through an extensive interview process with each client to really understand what is their fashion history and how do they see it today? Where do they want it to go? And we'll take clothing from their closet, which are the images on the left. And then together with the client, I'll design an intervention to reconfigure those into new pieces. So you can see every element of the three garments on the left were deconstructed and reassembled into the garment on the right. And then if you go to the next one, it's just another example of a client that I worked with. So in the center, the top image is the before garments for the image on the right, and the bottom image are the before garments for the two pieces that are on the left. So every client I work with is really different. The process is about affirmation, not prescription. So if people resonate with my aesthetic, then I'm happy to make things that look like I made it. But if that's not what they wear, then I always want to create something that the client will actually wear. So yeah, I just wanted to throw that in there because it's a service that I always have available. If anybody is interested in signing up, you can email me or DM me for more information. It's just another way where I'm trying to prevent textile waste as well as affirm that clothing ends up having a lot of deeply emotional and sentimental value. And so even if as is, it doesn't work for you anymore, there's always ways to intervene and create things out of what exists that will work for you excuse me, and retain that, that like felt value that that clothing can contain. I feel like I kind of failed to mention that in total, all my work is textile focused, whether it's the wearable furniture and rugs, the more fine art, wall pieces, the paintings, the clothing, everything is really focused on textiles. And I think, again, that just circles all the way back to my upbringing, just like growing up in a garment factory. Like, this is what I learned. This is what I know. And I feel really lucky to be doing what I'm doing. So thank you everyone for, for showing up and listening to my presentation. <laughs> that is so great. Thank you so much. Um, the last model was one of our students. So oh, <laughs> I love Jess have some connections. Um, uh, I want to open it up to folks who might have questions like live questions here. And I can do that while also kind of scrolling through some of the things that are written here. Somebody wanted to hear about the shoes that were created as part of the Final Cut project early on. Yeah, the concept for my thesis collection, it was called The Body is a House, a Home, a Temple. And so the idea was like building your life on a solid foundation. So I wanted to create shoes that look like rocks. So this is one area where I'm like, mm, not the most sustainable approach because I use spray foam on found shoes. And that spray foam, you know, it, I, it's something that I, there's all... <laughs> I did it and I'm really happy with the outcome of the piece, but yeah, I sprayed spray foam on a pair of found shoes and then I carved the face into it. And then I covered it with like plaster mixed with rocks or something. I can't remember specifically spackle, whatever that material was, and then painted it with house paint. And that whole collection is painted with house paint that I found in a corner 
on a shelf at my art studio at the time. And that that's still a big uh, way that I manipulate my textiles today is through house paint and, and found materials like that. So yeah, I always think like I should get back to doing some shoes, but I, I, I just haven't done it yet. It's, I have a, I have a whole thing of shoes to work with and it's there, but it just, it's not there. Yeah. I love it so much. Um, I know that there are a bunch of people who have sort of just commented and you're going to get these, we'll send it to you. But uh, Rose uh, said, I love that you knew what you wanted to gain from Parsons, whether some of your professors understood your vision or not. Like that, what a great way to go into, into your education. Thank you. Yeah. It made it harder that it was so contrary to what my teachers wanted to teach me, but <laughs> I'm glad I went. I learned a lot. Yeah. Uh, what dance companies have you worked with? Um, maybe someone who has, oh, Karen has worked with dancers and can see how great your work would be added to a chore choreographed piece. Thank you. Yeah, having a dance background, I think, shows up in my work, whether or not it's for a dance company. Um, but I worked with Nia Amina, who's a local choreographer, and they did a performance called Without Leaving the Ground She Flew. And that was the sort of like ombre sunset painted with the clouds. There were three dancers. So I made these three different like morning, day, night cloud looks for them. And then I worked with a group who's based in Brooklyn called House of Pavement. And they had a performance um, in 2021 that the title is all in Italian. So I can't remember what it is, but I made work for that. And they presented at the Ace Hotel at one point in Brooklyn. And then I just did some costumes actually inspired by Helen Ramona Part Two for the Seattle Project, which is another uh, Seattle-based dance group. And I, I work with a lot of dancers as models, um, which I always love because I, I feel like they've got the poses that really evoke the mood I want to project through my work, which is like very ly lyrical and ethereal and powerful as well. It was beautiful to watch um, as you uh, had your, the pieces on in the show and you posed uh, all of those things that you just said were just like so obvious uh, in, in while you were posing. It was just a beautiful thing to watch. Oh, uh, somebody said it's great that you use, oh, this is Zola. Um, it was great that you used material from old Seattle Curtain Factory. Uh, she knows someone who worked there for decades. So it's what a nice connection. That's so cool. I wish I'd taken more. There was so much in the basement. It was overwhelming. Um, lots of love, just lots of love. Um, Patrick asks, Hello, Patrick. Did you find it difficult to combine your practices from a sharing public perspective? Can you say that again? Did you actually, Patrick, say it. <laughs> I don't quite know how to. Oh, okay. Say, it. Uh, but yeah, like when you have multiple practices um, and multiple interests, and I mean, maybe when you're working on it, it's, it makes sense for you to combine them because that's what you're interested in. <clears throat> but then as far as like sharing multiple streams of creativity, what what is that like for you? Yeah, that's a good question because I find it difficult to balance. I feel like predominantly I, I share my work in fashion um, and I want to find a way to better integrate fashion into fine art so that those two things can be seen simultaneously. And I think the North Seattle College Gallery really gave me that opportunity to present like painted works of fine art, the wearable furniture interspersed with clothing to, to show like these, these are multiple things created to exist in the same world. But as far as like social media is concerned, I don't even know how to accurately represent the work that I do there. I feel like I don't dance as much as I used to, and that that's something I I want to reintegrate into my practice, but I've just been trying to focus more on bridging that gap between the fine art and the fashion so that they can live in the same world and really trying to design spaces that are intentionally 
mixing those two together, but it can be hard and confusing, even for me. I'm <laughs> like, what am I doing? Thank you. Thank you for that question, Patrick. Also, yeah. Patrick asks, um, is my clown costume from the Curtain Factory? Yes, it is. It is, yeah, that blue velvet was the last of it. Paula. Now, thank you so much. That was just amazing. Everything I hoped it would be and more. Um, so <laughs> I do have, um, I had my students prepare some questions from our sculpture class and maybe one of these ties into a question I was gonna ask. The first time that I met you, you pulled out a flip phone <laughs> and, and I was like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Because um, I don't do a lot of social media anymore, but during the pandemic, when I was on it, it was like, Janelle was just my Instagram. I was like, what, what is she making next? And what is the thing that I can own for my, for my wardrobe? And so to see that you pulled out a flip phone, I was like, oh, this is interesting. You seem to have found a way to maintain or figured out a balance right between using social media as a tool to kind of help promote your work but maybe in a healthier way through the you know by limiting some of your access to it so that's one question I guess maybe that I have and then I'll in order to not overwhelm you I'll, I'll let you answer that and then I have a follow-up okay yeah thank you I'm, I, I try my best to engage with social media in a healthy way, but I think just being a part of any of those platforms is toxic. Like there, there's a lot of obligation there. You can fall in the comparison trap very easily there. There's the tendency to take things personally or start to like future catastrophize when like recently I've been posting things and like this just not getting any attention. And so I'm like, what does that mean? You know, like my career is going downhill and it's not like it's not even a reflection on the work that I'm creating. You know, it's like totally outside my control, but I've never had a smartphone. I, I just stuck with a flip phone. And, and part of it is, I think just to be ornery, like I just didn't want to go there. And so I didn't, but I did at a certain point have to get an iPad and that's how I started engaging on Instagram. And so I think not being on social media for so long stunted my career to a degree because I wasn't able to get my work out there in the way that other people are consuming and presenting their own work. But I do really appreciate when I'm out in the world, just having a flip phone, because I, I want to try to be present both like in time and space, but also in myself. And I can find myself disassociating, just like scrolling through Instagram and being like, oh, that's a good recipe. Like, oh, and I want to stop doing that. But it's it's hard. It's at, at a certain point, like I it could be the only place that I have human contact in a day because I'm just at my studio. So yeah, trying to be healthy and intentional about connecting with people on there who I I know and I love and I trust and I can commiserate with <laughs> about that tension. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you. And uh let's see the follow-up. So since many of this, many of uh, people who are watching now or will be watching our students, I wanted to highlight sort of a practical question. And this is actually from Taylor and Taylor's in the room. So Taylor, if I misrepresent your question, feel free to kind of follow up with that. Um, but the question was, how do you manage your time amidst so many projects, right? You listed how many garments you made in 2020, 2021 and 22 and where you are this. So, um, and then how do you ensure follow through and maintain vision and motivation while juggling so much? especially in times of self-doubt. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like I have a superpower, which is that I'm very fast and I always have been very fast. I make executive decisions. I don't spend time languishing over the contemplation of put it here, put it there, put it here, put it here, put it there, put it here. I just say, there it is. And we move on. <laughs> Um, and so sometimes I end up making things where I like, I hate that. Like I made some mistakes and it's not how I wanted it to turn out, but then I just keep moving forward because there's always more work to do. And I, I treat my creative practice like a nine to five. I show up at my studio at eight o'clock. I leave here at seven sometimes. Like I'm just here all the time. And I write, I write a lot of lists. 
I have a document on my computer right now where here's another list. This is like my year list. And so I'm always like crossing things out, editing it, reconfiguring what's coming next. I do a lot of planning and I hold myself accountable. Like if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. If I've committed to something, I follow through with a commitment. I don't let myself off the hook. And in some ways, I think that's very mature. In other ways, I think it's very masochistic and self-destructive. <laughs> so it's like trying to figure out how to both be professional, but also like gracious to yourself. Cause I'm not a machine, but I literally grew up being told that I was a machine. Like that was a nickname at one point in my life. But yeah, I sort of just appreciate all of that and the honesty of it as well, because there are practical and sort of impractical aspects to the creative process. And also when it uh, comes to trying to make a living off of it. And so, and then trying to think about sustainability, but also sustainability of a practice and your health and all of that. So it's complicated, which you just you sort of iterated. I'm going to pause for a second and see if anyone else has other questions or we're getting, getting close to time. That's great. I love that you brought your student questions to this because I know um, they're always insightful. So I have one more I think I could highlight because I really, I'm going to put it in the chat because it's kind of a long question, but I'll also read it. But I just love so much of the humor and play in your work. And the, there are like several clown costumes that are part of it. And there's so much of my own personal life where I just feel like a clown. Like I just am putting on a show, <laughs> just like trying. I think some of it's like dark humor. It's a way to grapple with reality when there's, when reality isn't that beautiful. So I, I love that about your work. And Max, um, who is someone that owns some of your work and has also been following you, says a lot of uh, her work seems to incorporate ruffles, bows, and puff sleeves, all resembling very regal or dramatic historical garments. But the zero waste aspect creates a sense of collage. Does she think about this combination of styles in a historical sense? And then some of these look like meticulous high fashion clown suits. The combination of the patterns and varieties of shapes create a very interactive garment. And does she think about the way that the clothes move on the body while creating them? Which I think you answered maybe that second part. But um, the first part is interesting if you think about the sort of uh, regal and historical aspects as they relate to clown suits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. I love the clown aesthetic. Um, I am very much into late Victorian, early Edwardian clothing. And I think that's where much of the aesthetic is coming from, like the big shoulder, the big sleeve, the like articulated waist. And, but then it's mixed with like, um, most recently sort of square dancing skirts, like really full skirts, open backs. I, I do. And I don't think about how the garment moves on the body. Um, sometimes it's just happenstance that things like have a lot of play. And again, that's my, my relinquishing to the zero waste process. Like it, it can create garments that have a lot of like movement and, and play. And I think that's also why my work, even though it could be considered pretty distinctly feminine, being that there are a lot of ruffles and bows and puffs, it also has a masculine edge to it because it's a lot of square shapes as opposed to curved shapes. So it kind of like lives in an intermediate world of like, anybody could be wearing this stuff. You know, I personally don't because I like, I can't, <laughs> I see it and I love it. And I want to add to my life, you know, <laughs> but I, yeah, I'm happy to, I'm happy to make it and happy to know a lot of people love to live in it, but they are, yeah, they are like special precious garments. I am creating things I want people to wear every day, but I want people to wear them every day with a sense of reverence. Like this is special. Like this ordinary moment is special. And this is a garment to wear in an ordinary moment moment that becomes extraordinary. So I, I think there is, yeah, that kind of like twist to it, which feels very clownish. They're sort of tricky and, and playful in that way. Wow, this has just been a pleasure for me to, to be able to sort of live in the gallery and amongst all of those pieces for over a month and to now hear more about it and get more information on all of it. It's just, it's been a pleasure. So I thank you for that. I thank you for coming to talk to us. It's always, I think it's a big ask to ask people to come and talk about their work, but um, 
I love that people are willing. So I, th I thank you for that. And with that, I, I think I'm going to stop the recording. Is that all right? Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. I really appreciate being able to show my work and talk about it too. So thank you.